This video was brought to you by CuriosityStream. It's fair to call 2021 a giant disappointment, right? Woo, 2020 is over! Worst year in history behind us! Let the good times roll! 2021 is going to be the best year of our lives. There's going to be nothing but sunshine and roses. We're going to party like it's some other goddamn year than the one we just had. And I don't know, that's, that's just not what happened. I mean, yeah, it was better than 2020, but we're still dealing with a lot of the same garbage. It's hard for me not to look at it as a letdown. And unlike 2020, where music felt to me like a life raft and a truly dismal time to be alive, I found it a little hard to get into much this year. Now, on some level, these recaps of the year are redundant. Every year it's like, oh, there were some good things that happened this year, there were some bad things that happened this year, what a year, huh? And trying to impose a label on an entire year of music is dumb. But to me, this is not a great year in pop music. As judged by the only standard I use, which is that I was more interested in writing the worst list this year than the best list. Boy, there was some shit this year, and I'm blaming it for every disappointment I had. And now that I've hyped it up, I'm sure this list will be a disappointment too. So let's do this. We're counting down! The top 10 worst hit songs of 2021! Number 10. Alright, we got a lot of bad songs to get through, so why don't we just get this one out of the way right now. Yeah, you knew this one was a lock. This year, Adam Levine's sell-off period reached a full decade. And during that entire time, I have asked and asked, why does Maroon 5 still exist? And I think I finally have the answer. It's to help me fill out the worst list. Truly, the most noble reason to create art. So really, I owe Adam Levine a debt of gratitude. Now, in one sense, this is just a lifetime achievement award. For almost the entire decade I've been doing this, Maroon 5 has been filling up my worst list. Last year, I put one of their songs as an honorable mention, even though I didn't really think that one was actually that bad, I just simply don't know how not to at this point. If Adam Levine ever actually made a good song again, it'd probably make me so angry at this point that I'd probably just put it right at the top of the worst list anyway. That said, I do actually hate this one in particular. Oh boy, a Maroon 5 song about having a relationship with a hot woman and it's terrible and they fight all the time but they just can't stop themselves from having hot sexy sex with each other. It's beautiful, it's bittersweet, you like a broken old Boy, that's a new one, Adam. You and I go rough. We keep things and slamming the door. Sure need another one of those from you. Maybe Pink will write a song about the struggles of marriage next. If he was going to repeat one of his songs, I wish it wouldn't have been his most irritating. And I will lie awake, beautiful oh, it's such a mistake that I keep having sex with her. It's so bad it makes me weep all over my million dollar car. Bite me. You can probably credit the song's success to Megan Thee Stallion, who is also on here. And congratulations to Maroon 5 for a major achievement, getting Megan to turn in the first verse from her that I didn't like. You did me wrong cause I let you. Usually I like my situations beneficial. Mm. Got me looking stupid. The only way I'm coming back to you is if you dream it. Lucid. Good God. A hashtag rap. What year is it? Are we all gonna do the ice bucket challenge? These Maroon 5 guest verses generally come from good rappers, but I've never enjoyed a single one. I don't even know if the verses are bad or if they just turn unappealing when they come served with Maroon 5 brand processed music loaf. Really early in 2021, Adam Levine lamented that there are no big famous bands anymore. And for the first time in a while, Levine actually sounded sincere to me. Because some abstract love of bands as a concept must be the only reason he still pretends Maroon 5 still exists. As we near the 20 year mark of Maroon 5, I despair of getting rid of Levine ever. Much like in the song, this is a mistake we are doomed to keep making. I wouldn't call it beautiful though. Next. Number 9. 
Number nine. Maybe I'm the only one who does this, but does anyone else ever get so uninterested in something that they become fascinated by it? Maybe you don't like talking too much about yourself, but you should have told me that you were thinking about someone else. Tate McRae was a mildly famous child dancer on various reality shows, and as she neared adulthood, she got into music. I can only guess what attracted her to songwriting or what kind of music she wants to be making, but it's very clear what the label wants from her. They want Billie Eilish. And by God, they're gonna take their hammers of this girl until she fits into a Billie Eilish shaped hole. Literally, the first single she released was co-written by Billie Eilish, which would make me feel very weird if I were her. That one didn't take off, but one of her originals did. No, you like this. I kind of became fixated on this song this year. Not so much because I didn't like it, so much as I couldn't imagine why anyone would. Like, why was I hearing this so often on the radio? It's not catchy, it's not compelling. Like, it's a breakup song about some ex who wants her back. Suddenly you're asking for it back. Could you tell me where'd you get the nerve? And it's all this big drama, big rolling thunderclouds, and it all builds up to... When you broke me first. Uh, I don't know how to tell you this, but this really needed to end on a more cutting line than, well, you started it. Did she think whoever this was about was gonna be hurt by that? The answer is no, she didn't. Because that person doesn't exist, this isn't based on anything that actually happened. I read a bunch of articles that were like, how did you write a breakup song without ever having your heart broken? Well, by being not good at it, obviously. There's nothing wrong with writing fiction, of course, but in a year dominated by girls writing about their real heartbreak, the lack of any authentic pain in this song is painfully noticeable. I feel like maybe this song could have worked if it had more energy, but it was jammed into a Billie Eilish mold of sulky, whispering girls. It doesn't seem like this was what this song was supposed to be. After listening to it a dozen times, I realized that if anyone besides Billie Eilish was making Billie Eilish music, I probably wouldn't like it. Like 10 years ago, at least your mediocre pop would have an okay beat and you could dance to it. This just feels like the movie trailer cover version of itself. When you broke me first, you broke me first. Now, I'm not gonna say this girl is talentless or has no future, but if she does have a future, it's probably by putting as much distance between herself and Billy as possible. None of the couple other minor hits she's had has sounded anything like this. It seems like her strengths are elsewhere. That's my advice for her, at least. Tate, if the label wants you to write something called Even More Happier Than That, turn it down. Number eight. Uh, I should say that overplay does count against you on these lists. I don't remember hating this the first time I heard it, but it's been a whole year now, and I would honestly rather eat glass and listen to that glass animal song ever again. Sometimes all I think about is you, late nights in the middle of June. Glass Animals is a pretty okay indie band, and this year they had their breakout hit, Heat Waves. It went viral on the internet through a convoluted process I don't really understand, involving real person slash fic about internet celebrities, and boy, as an internet content creator myself, I got weird feelings about that. But that's neither here nor there. The point is, I also really do not like this song. Usually I put something on TV, so Heat Waves was the little indie hit that could. It charted at number 100 in the first week of the year and just slowly kept rising all through 2021 until by December it was a top 10 hit. For a band that might not see this level of success ever again. In the MP3 era, these guys would probably be mislabeled 80% of the time. But they're getting a big bump off this. And boy, aren't I a massive dick for putting these unassuming little underdogs on the list. I don't know. After 12 months of this song, I just find it so grating that I never want to hear it again. And I've had difficulty explaining why. It might just be that I missed guitars. Remember when rock music had guitars? Guitars made a big comeback in 2021. It's been great. We have grit and energy again. Oh, right. Rock can rock. I forgot. But even then, this kind of crossover alt-rock hasn't had guitars in like a decade, and I like plenty of those. But this, there's just nothing to it. No emotions, no bounce, no beat, just vibes. Just vibes. Vibes, vibes, vibes. I'm so sick of vibes. Give me a riff, a hook, something other than this grim, colorless trudge. You'll be better off in someone you... 
Like, it's about breaking up with someone because you want them to be happy, just like that Bastille song, but when they did it, they had emotion. The guy from Glass Animals just kind of mules and hisses like a smarmy radiator. No, I gotta let you go. Like, I can point to the things I don't like. That funny trap voice sounds like ass. <laughs> Lyrics aren't great. Bad look, that's perfectly yeah, that's a perfectly ungood lyric. But mostly I just don't like the sound of it. You know, it's a tiny bit pop and a tiny bit trap and a tiny bit rock and a tiny bit electronic. This shit just sounds like fucking nothing. It just has this bland artificial aftertaste to it, like like freeze-dried microwave mashed potatoes. You know, it is food, but it still kind of sort of tastes like plastic. That's what this is. Sometimes all I think about is how much I don't like this song. Next. Number seven. I've already close to forgotten this happened, but 2021 was the year that Kanye and Drake went head to head and put their albums right against each other. Now, in my opinion, this was a real douche versus turd matchup, but by this point, you know what I feel about the two men. Drake dumps out another monstrously long album every couple years, and most of it goes in the garbage, but you can always count on at least a couple gems. Whereas Kanye, last time he made anything I really liked, they were still making Harry Potter movies. So I already knew where I was gonna stand on this. And then I actually listened to them. Now don't get me wrong, the Kanye album was also pretty bad, but there were songs on it I enjoyed. I just couldn't find anything in Drake's to like, especially this. Hey, all right, that's fine, okay. <laughs> wow, Drake is ridiculous. Look at him dressed like an old fat guy. Isn't this funny? Huh? I spent a lot of my career making fun of Drake, and it took me way too long to realize that that's what he wants you to do. Like this album cover, what the hell is that? It's a thing that makes you go, what the hell is that? Which is what he intended. Every meme just makes him more powerful. Everything he does is designed to go viral. So when Drake has his lead single sample one of the biggest meme hits in history, he knows exactly what he's doing. But personally, I think this was a pretty grave miscalculation. Like. I thought that entire Drake album was dull, but Drake has been putting moody raps over super spare beats his entire career. It's what he does. But this, the lead single, I think it actually is the worst song on the album because it's supposed to be fun. It's something different when he takes a song that was already funny and he puts it into Future's drugged out mumble. It's like the exact opposite of what he's trying to do. And I don't like putting Drake on here because I do like him, or at least I did. I well shit, you got me. I honestly can't remember at this point. Like, it's just annoying to see him flop around like LMFAO in this video as if there was anything comedic going on. The original I'm Too Sexy was one of the most mind-meltingly catchy and stupid earworms of all time, and it went to some hilarious places. Shake my little touch on the cut wall. There's just nothing fun or even surprising about this. I get cash wherever I fly, got bitches sexing on me. None of the flexes are interesting. It's not sexy at all. And for what it's worth, I watched my entire social media feed erupt over girls like girls because Drake called himself a lesbian. Again, I have no idea why this shocked and amused everyone so much. Like, have you not heard frat boys making that joke for decades? How are you not tired of this? But at least people are talking about girls like girls. I haven't heard anyone say shit about Way Too Sexy. It's that dull. This song is so boring that even Young Thug, who I tend to like, is completely ignorable, which that's gotta be a first for him. And if I had any doubts who won the Kanye versus Drake rivalry, I think it was settled when, right as I was writing this, Kanye and Drake buried the hatchet and did a big concert together. And Kanye pulled out classic after classic, and Drake, to the delight of no one, played nothing but his boring new shit. Oh, guess I'm a Kanye stan again. Just gotta try and forget everything he's done in the last five years, up to and including this week. Not to worry though, Drake will be back with another hundred more new songs next year, and maybe this time one of them will be interesting. <sighs> Save your for day. Number six. When I complain about modern indie rock mixing everything together so that it all sounds like nothing, I guess, uh, you know, I guess that's better than mixing the worst of every genre together so it sounds like shit. Yeah, we fancy like apple on a date night. Got 
at the Burma Street State with the Oreo shake. It's some Walker Hayes scored country music's biggest cross over the year with Fancy Like, a TikTok viral smash about how when he and his girl are feeling fancy, they go to Applebee's, drink Natty Light. She even bothers to put on makeup and he puts on a clean pair of pants. Hell, he puts on pants. That's how you know it's a special occasion. Ha 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 ha. To be clear, this is not a song about being poor, it's about being boring and lazy. Like literally. What he said is that this song is about how it's okay if today is the same as yesterday. And you know what? Yeah, I get that. Not everyone gets to go out and try new trendy cuisines every day. Some of us only have the same strip mall to go to on date nights, and there are worse things in the world than that. I get that. There's something that I'm not embarrassed by eating at Applebee's. But I think Walker Hayes very much is, because he sings about it in just the most obnoxious and cartoony way possible. We go to Applebee's, aren't we fucking rednecks? No? It's a normal thing to do. What is your deal, Hayes? Walker Hayes lowers himself in dignity so much you would think he was an Adam Sandler character. I mean, he certainly has enough shameless product placement. Like, I did a whole video about how much I hated this one, and you know, I did a lot of worrying that it made me look like a snob. I mean, I am a snob, but I just try to hide it. But why do I have to worry? Walker Hayes is the one doing the poverty cosplay here. Like, he may or may not have been broke in his life, but by this point, he can probably afford a real cooler. Natty in the styrofoam, squeak, squeak it in the truck bed all the way home. Ugh. I don't care how proud you are of your place in the world. The sound of squeaking styrofoam can't be high on your list of pleasures in life. Also, did you take your own beer to Applebee's? You know, I keep saying that this song is intentionally cringy as a defense mechanism, but maybe not. Maybe Walker Hayes is just actually that embarrassing. I just assume otherwise, because I can't imagine someone writing a song like this sincerely. It's literally to the tune of the Hokey Pokey. Alabama, Jama, she my Dixieland delight. You do the Hokey Pokey and you turn yourself around. Look, there's nothing wrong with celebrating on a budget or living in Nowheresville. I love cheap thrills. But when you make it sound as unpleasant as this, like, no. Like, this is a 40-year-old man rapping. No one wants that. And by the way, bro, I'm not sure your wife is as happy with your lifestyle as you think she is. She's so low maintenance. Like, if you see her looking at Facebook pictures of an old boyfriend who moved to the city, I'd start worrying. Or hell, even a more broke redneck would look like an upgrade next to you, as long as he isn't a walking, living commercial! That's how we do, how we do, fancy light. Ugh, product placement. Anyway, before we continue, this video was brought to you by Curiosity Stream. Ever wonder what your favorite punk bands are like when they're forced to grow up? Well, you can watch your favorite bands like Blink-182, Black Flag, Rise Against, and Bad Religion as they tackle the most hardcore, dangerous shit they've ever pulled, Parenthood. That's in the documentary The Other F Word, and you can see it all on Curiosity Stream. Go to curiositystream.com slash Todd in the Shadows, and you will get an entire year for just $14.79. That's nothing. Not only is that a 26% discount on the regular price, you will also get free access to Nebula, a streaming video platform built by and for independent creators like Lindsay Ellis, Minute Physics, and myself. So you will get all the high budget premium content you get on CuriosityStream, plus all the independent video creators on Nebula. Once you use the code and get CuriosityStream, you'll get a welcome email from Nebula giving you access, and you'll have access to both services. So sign up now, click the link in the description, and enjoy. Well, anyway, moving on. Number five. We were this close. Yeah, you got that yummy, yum, that yummy, yum. This close to never seeing Bieber forever. His disastrous album Changes with its shockingly terrible lead single and video had Career Killer written all over it. But manager Scooter Braun was not going to let his biggest cash cow run dry that easily, and so he spent the last 18 months cashing in every favor he had, and now Bieber is back on top. Yay. I got my peaches out in Georgia. Oh yeah shit. I get my weed from California. That's that shit. I took my chick up to the I've had a couple friends who are only casual pop listeners be really surprised to find out that Bieber's actually had a very good year. Doesn't seem that way because a lot of his more recent songs have been extremely forgettable, and they've also been collaborations, and since Bieber has always had no personality, they all kind of seem more like someone else's songs. Including his biggest hit this year, Peaches, which got most of its energy from its two co-stars. 
I truly mean no disrespect to Daniel Caesar or Gibeon, two up and coming R&B stars who do quite a lot to make me not hate this song the first few times I heard it, but despite their best efforts, this unfortunately remains the song of Justin Bieber. Partly because he's way more famous than those other two guys, but also because despite their smoothness, there's only one real memorable part of the song. Kind of reminds me of like a Black Eyed Peas song where the groove is fine at first and then by the hundredth time the emptiness really gets at you because there's nothing to it except the one maddeningly catchy line that gets in your head. I, got my out in Georgia. Oh, yeah, like, I get what it's supposed to mean. Like he only gets the primo shit from the best places, but it just got more and more inane every time I heard it. I got my peaches out in Georgia. Oh, yeah. Like what are you talking about? Do you, do you travel to Georgia for peaches? Do you import them? Also, who fucking cares? I got my peaches out in Georgia. Do you eat more than two peaches in a year? And if you do, are you like, well, these better be genuine Georgia peaches or I'm not touching them. What does it matter? It's like singing, I get my potatoes out of Idaho. Who cares? Locally grown is probably fine. I, I know, this sounds like nitpicking, but there's just nothing else to the song. The only other lyrics that stand out are the cringy ad-libs where he calls his wife a badass bitch. Took my chick up to the north, yeah, badass bitch. This girl is banging. She's so low maintenance, humiliating. Now it'd be easy for me to say that, you know, I prefer the 90s peaches. peaches come from a can. They were put there by a man. But honestly, these two songs are more alike than you'd think. They're both pointless, inane novelty songs, except one of them gets the joke. I got my peaches out in Georgia. It's not even like a full chorus, it's more like half a chorus repeated twice. In fact, it may be the same one take played over and over again, because Beaver sure doesn't build on it at all. I got my peaches out in Georgia. Yeah, it's catchy. I'm not surprised it's a hit. But all I hear when I hear this is, you know, Dance Monkey or Blue Daba D or one of those other maddening earworms. The result is just a smooth mambo number five. And who needs that? Number four. She told me put my heart in the bag. <sighs> okay. I didn't get Juice World. I didn't like him. Then he died tragically and I felt bad. I'm not gonna tell you I was wrong or that I like all his songs now, but I feel like I appreciate things about him now that I missed the first time. So when I put this song on here, I worry that I'm just making the same mistakes all over again, but <sighs> you know what? I will take that chance. You cut out a piece of me and now I bleed internally left it without you, without you. 2021 was the breakout year of Kid Leroy, a teenage Australian that was allegedly Juice World's protege. And I'm trying to be nice here, like as a singer, he certainly has an extremely expressive voice. But I'm scared to be alone. Communicates a lot about his character immediately. The same way that the squeaky voice teen on The Simpsons really embodies a character. Whoops! Hell in the fryer! I'll get it out! Oh! Oh! And that's as close as I got. Obviously, I did not succeed in finding a way to like this. And it hurts for me to think about what life could possibly be like without you. Like, it's an acoustic guitar song about how sensitive and sad he is, with one of the most overused titles in music, played with four very familiar chords in a very familiar order. Without you. You, As longtime viewers know, it's like it was designed to piss me off personally. This song alone could win you Todd in the Shadows bingo. Like, I know we're all sad now and sad boys are the thing, but Kid Leroy doesn't sound sad or depressed like Juice World. He just sounds like a sulking asshole, especially in the song's most infamous line. So there you go. Oh, can't make a wife out of a hoe. Oh, what the fuck are you talking about, kid? Can't make a wife out of a oh, oh. An Australian teenager has no right to be singing a line like that, not just because it's misogynistic, but also because it has nothing to do with the song. The girl he's so upset at seems to have done no hoeing, and also, you weren't gonna marry her. You're what, like 14? Like, did you buy a ring? Were you talking about having kids? Come on. I guess that's a particularly authentic teenage thing. You're upset at a girl, so you try to be sexist, but you don't even know how yet, so you just repeat things you heard from other songs. Okay, just so I can hedge my bets here in case Kid Leroy becomes another voice of a generation. Uh, his big hit this year, Stay, the Justin Bieber duet, I will admit that it was a lot better than this. It will not be making the best list for the purely petty reason that I react negatively to both their voices, but 
Uh, yeah, there was a lot to like about it. The beat is smooth enough to sand off Leroy's rough edges and energetic enough to give Bieber some personality, but uh, I don't know. Instead of splitting the difference between the two, I kind of wish they'd just given it to one good singer. Or maybe I'm just penalizing it because of Without You. Now I bleed internally left without you. The worst thing about this song isn't Leroy's douchebag demeanor or random sexism. Those are arguably the best things about it. The worst thing about it is that, except for those things, this song could have been written by anybody. It's irredeemably basic. And Leroy has to wail like a poltergeist just to make this song interesting at all. What I'm saying is, Kid Leroy is a less charming Louis Capaldi. I live my gut down, and then you pull the rug. I don't think I need to say more than that. Without you. Number three. Okay, I don't have a problem with Dan and Shay. There are a lot of people who do because, you know, they're the squishy, sensitive voice boys of country music. I never really liked their shtick, but I respect it. They've carved out a pretty unique spot for themselves in a genre of indistinguishable white guys. I can pick them out, and I know what they're about. That's something. I'm not gonna be like, they're not real country. I'm not one of those assholes. Or at least I wasn't, but this year something in me snapped. Get these sniveling simps out of here for the love of Christ. Here's to all the late night drunk phone calls that you picked up. Here's to all the bad decisions that you didn't judge. For the last few years, the major trend in country music has been something called boyfriend country. You know, singing to the ladies, gooey songs you can play at a wedding. Dan and Shay are probably the act most identified with it, but I think they might be losing their purpose. The country music audience is mostly women these days, so it's been a fascinating look into the fantasies of your average basic white woman. I wanna introduce you to my kid folks. A few of the newer singers would have been making bro country eight years ago, and they approached this whole new vibe like, yeah, I want a full commitment, and I'm gonna give you a ring, and a house, and a bunch of kids and all that someday, but also for the time being, I'm a horny, good-looking young guy who wants to give you a lot of bomb-ass sex. I want to see the way you look up under all those stars. I mean, it's hard to argue with that. Not my thing, but ladies, I get it. There's a couple billion people in the world. Dan and Shay can't promise to rock your world, obviously, because they're chaste as nuns. But for the first time, they don't seem to be able to provide you the passionate love either. It's every high and every low. Glad you exist. Wow, Dan and Shay, don't lay it on too thick. I'm glad you exist. I'm glad toothpicks exist. They're a useful implement. Dan and Shay may as well just name this song better than nothing. Every year I ask what the worst two seconds of the year is, and there are some obvious picks like I believe in G-O-D, don't believe in T-H-O-T. And of course, just from the last song. Can't make a wife out of a hoe. But my worst two seconds? Those ooh yeah yeah yes. There's a couple billion people in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh yeah yeah yeah. Hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it. In the world, the world. This song is already limp enough, but those soft little yeah yeah yeahs make everything sound so dinky and insincere. I think people will be shocked that this is above fancy like as the worst country song, but they do have one major thing in common. They're both obnoxiously self satisfied. Walker Hayes expresses it by burping and farting everywhere. Dan and Shay do it by putting on big, vacant smiles on their stupid faces, swaying back and forth like bobbleheads. I'm just so bad you There's nothing about this that sounds sincere or sweet to me. It sounds like a Hallmark card they bought for your anniversary at the last second, and I'd be very glad if it did not, in fact, exist. Ooh, I'm just so glad you Number two. Put your love in Ooh, I can feel the controversy coming off of this one. After trying for decades to make Eurovision a thing in America, they finally seem to have pulled it off. This year's winner, Italian trash rockers Monoskin, suddenly got big stateside when one of their earliest tracks caught on. I'm begging, begging. This is probably the most polarizing song of the year. I've rarely seen a song split people like this. I can totally see why. It's one of those songs where what people like about it is the same thing other people hate about it. Ultimately, I think, um, 
I think I like it. The song's fine. I've heard worse. Honestly, I think people should calm down, because let's be real. This is not the worst thing Eurovision did to us this year. Americans don't know that much about Eurovision, so they tend to think of it as a lot of fun. Just nonstop ABBA and Lordy and Epic Sax Guy and Ya Ya Ding Dong. But as someone who has watched quite a bit of Eurovision, yes, you will get your vampire man boat every year, but also there's just a whole lot of stuff that's bad and not in any of the fun ways. Historically, a lot of winners have been sickly balladeers. I'm afraid of all I am. For example, this is the Netherlands' Duncan Lawrence, who won in 2019. There's no Eurovision in 2020, obviously. And then in 2021, it became a big hit because we don't live in a world with linear time anymore. You can blame that on, again, TikTok, which resurrected the song two years late so that Americans could experience one of the worst sounding, worst written hit songs in recent memory. Dutchman Lawrence's big winning song was called Arcade, a song that combines the big, empty, epic sweep of this moment in pop with a deeply tortured metaphor. We were always a losing game, small town boy in a big arcade. I got addicted to a losing game. Has anyone ever whiffed on their metaphor as hard as this? I got addicted to a losing game. Like, I worry that something got lost in his translation here, because it sounds like what he was actually thinking of is a casino, which would be the logical venue because gambling is actually where you can lose something of importance and get your heart broken and your legs broken. But there are no stakes at an arcade. There's no real sense of loss when you lose at pinball. There's no kids crying at the Pac-Man machines. Like this whole idea does not work. It's like a video arcade, but sad. How many pennies in the slot? Oh, it's a penny arcade at that, too. Wow. It seems like you're trying to make the whole thing sound trivial and childish, which is kind of at odds with the screaming agony of the song. All I know, all I know, I didn't get the high score in ski ball. Give me up this roller coaster. Okay, it's a roller coaster now. I thought it was an arcade. Come on. I mean, I guess it's kind of funny that he won Eurovision with a song about a losing game. Well, he may have won Eurovision, but he loses on the only competition that counts, this list. Netherlands Null Pois! <laughs> and now, before the finale, some honorable mentions. My bad habits lead to late nights and then alone. This song's more boring than bad, but... I'm just including it anyway, because it has the worst goddamn video I've ever seen. Did you think that outfit looks good, Ed? What does this part mean, Ed? Why could you not just be happy being the plain-faced folk singer that you are? Let a young nigga come play your throat, deep stoke your throat till I make you choke, throw baby. Oh, I'm gonna choke, all right, on my own vomit. Man, dirty talk isn't as easy as WAP made it seem, huh? I decided this year I was going to be way nicer to Imagine Dragons. I mean, they seem like such nice guys. They mean real well. And unfortunately, this is me being nicer when I say that this is their worst song yet. Jesus. What the fuck are you doing? It was the summer of love. This has got to be the end of Shawn Mendes, right? Even by his standards, this is dismal. Has he ever sounded more like he's dying? It was the summer I hope you look just like your mama And love her like I do Puke God, country music has gotten so fucking sappy This is probably the saddest response song since It's Every Night, Sis Woof Very little wonder that Olivia Rodrigo won out on this one A, B, C, D Oh, this was just in time to make the worst list. A, B, C, D, E, F, U is... I, I, I'm sorry, that's a stupid line. If this song sticks around, maybe my next year I'll hate it enough to put it on the list proper. Everybody but your dog, you can love fuck off. <sighs> okay, here we go. Let's finish this. Number 10. 
number one. Aaron Lewis keeps it real. The guy from Stain's decade-long attempts to go country keeps hitting odd notes, for a lot of reasons, but a big one is that country music is mostly fiction. Johnny Cash never really shot a man in Reno, Merle Haggard isn't an Okie from Muskogee, Garth never showed up in boots to a black tie affair, and Carrie Underwood never smashed her boyfriend's car. Only a select few, like Aaron's idol Hank Jr., will ever write their own real-life story. But that is what you get from Aaron Lewis. He can only give you his actual thoughts, feelings, opinions, and experiences. That might well be a positive thing if Aaron Lewis's thoughts and opinions were worth anything. Am I the only one willing to bleed? In many ways, 2021 was a year like no other. Especially for Aaron Lewis, who had his biggest solo hit in two decades. Am I the only one not brainwashed? It was a massive chode anthem about how everyone who doesn't think like Aaron Lewis is brainwashed, even Bruce Springsteen. Am I the only one? Quit singing along Every time they play a Springsteen song This despite the fact that Aaron Lewis cannot help but keep it real and admits that he sits around all day screaming at his television Screaming what the fuck in my TV In many other ways though, it was the exact same year for Aaron Lewis because he spent it the same way he spent every other year being a loud idiot who embarrasses himself in public, pissing off everyone around him, and complaining about the state of country music even though he's a Johnny-come-lately whose country songs sound uniformly like shit. Since I originally reviewed that song, Lewis has also put out a video for it, which helps clarify a few things. The thing that pissed me off the most about it was his crying over Confederate statues, the people who tried to destroy America. Another statue coming down in a town I got some comments trying to tell me that he must have meant the couple of non-Confederate statues that came down for various reasons. But Lewis helpfully shows us an actual Confederate statue in the video, which again, he's not even Southern. I'm allowed to have opinions on this, not you, you clam chowder eating masshole. You don't even go here. I also had some people disagree with my interpretation of this line. And worries about his kids as they try to undo all the things he did. I thought he was talking about himself. Some people think he was talking about President Trump. The video is not conclusive on that, but I don't think even Aaron Lewis thinks Trump is so great that he gets an unreferenced pronoun like he's Jesus. But I have consistently gone broke overestimating people, so who knows? The only one willing to fight. Now this is a list of hit songs, and this was not really a hit. It only plays as high as it did because of the fluke and chart tabulation that overweights physical sales. But even if the hit part is questionable, boy does it deserve to be at the top of this list of worst hits. Are its politics shit? Yes. Does it sound like shit? God yes, Aaron Lewis sings like a cow giving birth. If you don't like it, there's a freaking door. But also I think this, more than anything, sums up why 2021 was so disappointing. After 2020, I was hoping to live in less miserable times. Like maybe after the election, or once we all had vaccines, all the insanity was going to turn down. And Aaron Lewis wants you to know that no, the insanity will continue. Like this is a year where I had to hear multiple songs called Let's Go Brandon and a whole bunch of other miserable conservative songs. But the important thing to note is that they were all better than Aaron Lewis. Like yes, those Let's Go Brandon songs pissed me off, but that's what they were trying to do so I can only get so angry about that. I also had to hear Eric Clapton and Van Morrison's anti-lockdown shit, but that one was so laid back it was almost cute. Even Kid Rock in his anti-millennial record this year. Even he knew to put some respect on Bruce Springsteen's name. I'm not the only one. Like, let's be clear. If Aaron Lewis expressed the exact opposite sentiments that he does on this song, this would still probably be the worst song I heard all year. But I do have one sympathetic ear I can extend. If being Aaron Lewis means you can't enjoy Springsteen anymore, boy, that sure explains why he's such a miserable asshole. Imagine a world where you couldn't listen to Born to Run and instead all you had was this. Good God. Well, that was 2021, everybody. See you in 2022. I heard he shot truckles, make a big box. He made a shot turn, water spot on pillar car. I don't mask, Jericho make him.